Good morning. Welcome to the first stopwatch session at Charleston Conference. Um, just wanted to say hello and invite everybody to um, join in the conversation today. We are going to have um, everybody talk and do their, um, their presentations, and then we'll open it up for questions. So hold your questions until all the speakers have done their speaking, and we'll be ready to go. All right. Okay, I'll share the screen. Okay, now you can go find your. Okay. I'll take my mask off. Yeah, put yours back on. So just one of us and that's. Okay. Um, is what does this look like to people? Can you see? Can you see the screen? What are? Yeah, they should. Yeah. It just oh, okay. Can is anyone monitoring so we can check if anyone says they can't see? Yeah, let me go. Yeah. I think not yet. Right? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. want to make sure people can see. It looks a little different on Zoom, Karen. Um, just so you know, are you seeing are you seeing the slides or are you seeing my head in front of the screen? No, I'm seeing the slides. Yeah, but I'm just okay. seeing the um, I'm seeing the slides, but I'm also seeing like you know the kind of um, the presenter view. Oh, yeah. Oh, exactly. okay. But that's fine. I think that's, that's okay. I think as long as you can see the slides. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm okay, okay. to start. Yeah. Okay. Get the timer. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, I can't tell who I'm speaking to, but I am Karen Cohn. I'm collections analysis librarian at Temple University. My colleague, Annie Johnson, who you just heard, is attending remotely and she'll be participating in the QA with me later. She's the assistant director for open publishing initiatives and scholarly communications. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about a process that Annie and I led over the last year and a half. Um, that culminated with a set of guidelines and priorities for our library that will help us evaluate open access publishing initiatives. We decided to focus for the presentation on the process rather than the guidelines that we came up with because we think this is what will be most useful for other libraries. Some of you might be wanting to go through a similar process. Our situation um, is that our, our organization is Temple University Libraries and University Press merged under one dean. And before this project began, the libraries and press were already supporting open access in many ways. We have an institutional repository and our university press has an open access imprint. We also use our collections budget to support a number of publishing initiatives. But while we had a fair number of existing commitments to open access, the number of initiatives that we could potentially support has also been growing quickly. We've been contacted by publishers in recent years to talk about new funding models that they're developing. And we wanted to be in a position where we weren't just reacting to the offers that came to us. We thought if we, um, if we thought more broadly about what kinds of initiatives we wanted to support, then we'd be prepared to make quicker informed decisions about new initiatives as we learned about them. In talking to each other, we decided that what would be most helpful to us and the organization would be a report that would contain principles the library could use when evaluating open publishing initiatives. Annie and I were the leads on the project, but we wanted to involve as many of the libraries and press staff as possible. We felt that everyone needs some understanding of the changes that are going on in the scholarly publishing world. And also because we wanted the final report to be a statement of library-wide priorities, we wanted there to be significant buy-in. Staff were involved at varying levels, which I'll explain according to the degree of knowledge and input that their roles would require. Our first step was a series of discussions that were open to all libraries and press staff. We hope these discussions would inform the writing of the report and also educate staff. We had four events, each focused on different aspects of open. For each event, we sent out one or two articles for the staff to read ahead of the discussion. And we were lucky to have a guest speaker for one of the events, Lisa Dana Kinsliff, came to speak to us about transformative agreements in early March, 2020. The other three events were just internal discussions, which Annie and I facilitated. We started the series of, at the beginning of 2020 in person, and then we continued over Zoom with the second half. The events were all fairly well attended um, with roughly 25 people coming to each one, which is about a quarter of our staff and attendance was the same in both formats. 
after these discussions were over, then we started the process of writing. In order to make the scope of the report more manageable, we decided to focus on ways to support open access pub publishing using our collections budget specifically. We wrote about three funding strategies, transformative agreements, um, which we are not part of yet, continuing to pay for faculty APCs via our open access publishing fund, and continuing to support collaborative funding initiatives such as Knowledge Unlatched and possibly supporting new funding, new collaborative funding. The group writing the report was Annie and myself, as well as our scholarly communications team, which is made up of library staff whose primary role is not scholarly communications. They have a variety of roles. We had two or three people assigned to each section of the report to write a first draft, and then we all provided feedback and revised together. The people on the team had varying levels of knowledge regarding these different ways to fund OA, so we all had some learning to do. For the Open Access Publishing Fund in particular, we used the report as an opportunity to assess our current fund and see how we were doing, specifically which faculty's publications is it funding and which publishers is the money going to. Ultimately, we came up with four overarching priorities that we would like to see the libraries follow. These are uh, non-APC or BPC-based models, a focus on disciplines that are less likely to have grant funding, a focus on uni university presses or scholarly societies, and products where the cost is some comparable to a similar payload product, and also that the change in cost over time is predictable. I wanna point out that these are priorities, not requirements. And that's because there's so many different circumstances that come into play when evaluating an open publishing initiative. But the institution needs to make decisions based on each situation. In addition, none of the people who wrote the report are the ones who have the final say about the budget. We are in an advisory role. We also wrote specific recommendations for each type of publishing initiative. Again, that was transformative agreements, the open access publishing fund and crowdsourced funding initiatives. But our goal wasn't to choose one type of initiative over another, but to provide ways to evaluate instances of each initiative. We want to share some questions that you might ask yourself if you are planning to embark on a similar project. A lot of these questions came up for us or we refined them during the process of writing the report. And we think it would be helpful to think through these at the beginning if you were to do this. So first, how would you want to scope your project? This depends how much time you have, how many people you want to involve. We focused on open publishing initiatives, but you could expand to discuss all the ways that you support open, including staff time, open infrastructure, and other activities. Why are you supporting open access publishing initiatives? As we were writing this, we had the realization that some of the funding schemes would make our own faculty's work open, but others were not necessarily affecting our own faculty's work. The crowdsource funding might not be. That raised the question of what our goals are. So we recommend asking yourself, are you doing this to change scholarly publishing or to support your faculty and in making their work open? We ended up deciding it was a mix, but depending on your answer, you would have different priorities. Who should be involved in determining the priorities? We deliberately involved a lot of people in the organization so that we could get everyone on board to some degree. And this was valuable, but it also made the process longer and more complicated. So just, you'll have to decide what's right for your organization. The report um, has just been finished. It's not yet in the repository, but we have a link to the Google Doc here, which is in the slide. So um, you're able to view it um, and the slides will be online. Okay, let's see, let's go uh, here, and then y'all can go find your, okay, let's see, okay, if, the, if we could do a similar check, let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to X out of y'all, and then... Fine, Dawson and Crawford, here we go. And we're gonna start slideshow from beginning. Ah? Yeah. Okay, well, I hope that y'all can see and hear me. So Dylan, I'll hop out of the chair when it's your turn to speak. Okay. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Laurel, this is Jill. She's sitting here too, my right. Um, today, we're going to tell you about how we use focus groups to improve collection diversity. 
and better serve the needs of users. Our method improves transparency, evidence-based collection, uh, evidence-based decision-making and user-centeredness. Our big question is how can libraries better make decisions about collections to serve the needs of underserved users? Our soapbox, we have one. We always have a soapbox. There are, there are interdisciplinary interests in collections that are traditionally thought of as serving narrow disciplines. And librarians' traditional understanding of disciplinary user needs is uh, outdated. So those are our soapboxes. Little bit of background about our university. We work at University of North Texas in Denton outside of Dallas. We have centralized collection development and centralized acquisitions. We collection development folks have little to no connection with patrons ever. We work off campus, we never see them. Our goal is interdisciplinary collection development, inclusive collection development, taking into account all users needs. So we want to get feedback. How can we get feedback about patrons needs beyond our traditional understanding? We created some focus groups, which we call clusters. The cluster meetings are interdepartmental focus groups of library staff to collect subjective input. They provide all of the benefits that you see here on our slide. We are changing the clusters. We want to tell you about the old way versus the new way. First of all, we started out the clusters by meeting only within the disciplinary groups that are traditionally done in libraries and academia, uh, STEM, arts, humanities. We're doing it a new way now because this old way reinforces homogeneity in the collections and assumes all patrons within the discipline have the exact same needs. That's not true. It also excludes a lot of the library employees. If we just meet with librarians, there are tons of other people in the library who work directly with patrons. Now we're doing it in cluster groups based on user needs rather than the disciplines. And we're including all library employees instead of just the librarians. And Jill is going to provide more information. Uh, here are some of our key takeaways from the meetings. In terms of selection, there were some requests for specific types of resources. For example, non-traditional scholarly information formats are needed by all areas of the curriculum and research. We should think more broadly and creatively about what constitutes scholarship and what belongs in an academic collection. We need to continue our efforts to collect resources from underrepresented voices and perspectives. Many vendors are offering collections that support diversity and inclusion, and we should prioritize purchasing these collections. Equity, diversity, and inclusion should be a constant priority and a factor in all acquisition decisions at all times. We also, uh, we also need to find ways to identify gaps in our collections in these areas. Tangible collections, such as DVDs, print books, archives, and games are used in surprising new and creative ways. Tangible materials are still preferred and needed by many disciplines, such as visual arts, humanities, game studies, and media studies. They have their own discovery and access issues that we need to consider. We are currently having discussions about collection strategies in these areas, as well as coordinating efforts with our cataloging and metadata services and user interfaces units to make them easier to find. We should consider collecting materials in additional languages besides the rather narrow selection of languages we currently collect. We will reconsider our current policy on collecting materials in other languages and look at make, making strategic purchasing decisions based on user needs and specific subjects. Accessibility, discovery, and usability issues were also a common theme throughout the meetings. For example, newspapers are difficult to find and use because of the way they are packaged and sold by vendors. Users often struggle to find uh, articles in newspaper databases. We need to make a greater effort to document these issues and report them to vendors. We also need better coordination of accessibility issues across the library. In response, one of the priorities of our, of our library accessibility committee this year is to address library-wide management of accessibility services. Patron awareness of library resources, especially the many electronic resources that are available was a common theme in some of the meetings. Many users simply don't know what we offer or they don't understand how a resource could be useful to their research because the title of the resource doesn't describe the content or the database description is filled with library jargon. 
One of our projects this fiscal year is to systematically review and update our database descriptions to make them more understandable to all types of users. We are also exploring different methods for reaching users and promoting our resources. These conversations reiterated that there is wide ranging cross-curricular interest in collections traditionally thought of as serving a narrower set of disciplines. We should not make assumptions about the utility of a collection based on our traditional understanding of demands. Thanks, Jill. So our big, big question is, are we truly uh, centering the user in our decisions and conversations about collections? And what about the, under or the uh, underrepresented users? Um, we don't really know the answer to this question yet, but we are gonna try to do that better. We get lots of piecemeal uh, requests and do piecemeal work in collection development and acquisitions, but we want to do a more holistic uh, view of the collections going forward and talk about all users. Um, some of the, I, we are getting to the end of our time, so I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, but we want to keep these goals in mind, user-centered, evidence-based, and transparency, and we're going to do that by talking directly more to patrons themselves, talking more to the librarians, but also including more about the uh, users' needs themselves. One of the best questions that we've been asking real patrons, the faculty, and this, the graduate students in particular is, what keywords, what subjects are you working on for your dissertation theses and research? Uh, we've really gotten some great ones about, uh, great answers about that, particularly about our new focus, for example, an interdisciplinary subject, which is Africana studies, which is super broad. And I will say that the coolest answer we got for that was genome. That was the one that we did not expect and we got that straight from the uh, user. So that is the end of our presentation. And here's our contact info. Thank you so much. There we go. Yeah, I just want to get everything going first. Oh, wait, not share, present. Wrong button, sorry. Let me set a timer for myself because I'm very wordy. <laughs> Nobody else has that problem, right? No, not at all. All right. So my name is Jennifer Pate and I am the Open Education Resources and Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of North Alabama. And I'm gonna be talking about how uh, this past year, we started leveraging our curriculum mapping uh, initiative to support our campus OER adoption. A little bit of background of the OER. Yeah, that's shared. Let's just stop sharing. Yeah. Um... We're not seeing her screen. We're having technical difficulties. Hold on. Okay. Well, let me stop. Why don't I just, I can download it to the computer. Would that be easier, you think? Google. Yeah, I'm in Google Chrome. Yeah. Oh, is that what it was? There we go. Okay. <laughs> so we would just pass the, you know, the one title slide. So uh, let me just, uh, I think I have to share again. Because I don't know if people can see it because I had stopped the share on. Okay. Uh, but I don't see the share bar. Yeah, you're on the right place. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. There we go. And there we go. go. And see it, it all gone. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to restart my phone. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Here we go. Is this yours? Yes, it is. Okay. 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 It's 
go back to the front and present. And we see it there, see it online. Okay. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the OER Working Group. It's a collaboration between the library and our ed tech department. Um, and we have members from across campus that help us with um, implementing our university strategic plan aspirational goal, which is to have 50% adoption of OER across academic programs by 2024. So with the working group, we are the open education proponents on campus. We develop relationships with instructors. We do outreach with students. And uh, starting in May of 2020, we started administering a grant program. And it's not just for traditional OER, which follows the five R's, but it also includes uh, textbook affordability. Our kind of rule of thumb is if it's under $50, it qualifies for the stipend that we will give you. And we have started marking courses in Banner for students so that they can make informed choices when they are uh, choosing classes. If it's a low cost or no cost class, there's a, a, a designation in Banner. But the thing is, is we don't know about that hidden OER across campus. We don't know about those classes where instructors have just chosen to use OER, but didn't go through our stipend program. So we were trying to brainstorm and figure out how do we find those classes because faculty aren't always very robust in their response to you know, surveys and so forth. Um, and I'm a big fan of curriculum mapping. Um, I love Char Booth's work in this area. And I was reading some of her work and this quote particularly stood out to me because she's talking about, you know, everything that the student engages with and negotiates with on their path through their degree. And I thought that includes their textbooks. So why don't we use this curriculum mapping to help us figure out what textbooks they're also engaging with? So we had a couple of goals for the project. One, we wanted to see if we were anywhere close to that 50% adoption rate across all academic programs. We wanted to identify any programs that were heavy, heavily using OER on campus that we could possibly target to create a Z degree program or a zero cross degree program for students. Of course, we wanted to go back and mark all of the courses in Banner um, that we know that are OER or textbook affordability. And of course, outreach. As we do this, as we like announce our different goals and milestones that we hit, it generates more interest on campus. We get a lot more feedback from faculty. We get faculty who say, hey, how can I participate in this? This sounds really cool. Um, so those were the goals for the project. So this is the method in the madness. We started with a traditional course map. And um, if you've done curriculum mapping before, um, this is what a lot of libraries use to identify programs where we can offer our services for research or writing programs. So you have your course number, the name, how many credit hours, where it fits in whatever degree path it is, when it's offered, etc. But then we take it a step further. We also developed a second map that then took those courses in each degree program. We listed the instructors, the contact information for them the title of the book and the ISBNs for the books that they were using. And then we started adding bookstore costs, but that's a huge, huge heavy lift to go and look at every single bookstore cost. So we've kind of paused that because we were really just trying to find those that didn't have any book listed. Um, but you will see here that we did find one book uh, for AHS 303, where it falls within our textbook affordability because she's only requiring one book. We have it available through the library or they can rent, buy, or uh, used or new for under the $50 mark. So that course should be marked as a low cost or no cost course. This is a bigger example of what we're doing. This is kind of a, a highlighted snapshot. So here, this is our criminal justice program. And you can see like the box of four right there in the middle, uh, no books were listed for them. And you can see on the side, I put the dates that I emailed and you can also see that I had to email them twice to get a response because that happens. We know that happens, right? So uh, we reached out to faculty and we're doing this for, we I kind of have a template email that I send out and we're doing this for every single faculty that does not have a book listed for their course. And we have found so many faculty members who are using open education resources or textbook affordability. As a matter of fact, out of that box of four right there in the middle, uh, Wayne Bergeron and Susanna Taylor 
are using open education resources for almost all of their classes that we didn't know about. So now we can go back, we can mark their courses in Banner, we can um, make sure that uh, when we were getting ready to implement an award for faculty for textbook affordability or OER championship, um, that they can be included in consideration for that award because it, it shouldn't just be for people who went through the stipend program. We should also be rewarding people who took the initiative on their own. So um, we are almost through with our data scrape. Uh, it is trending toward we are at the 50% adoption rate for OER or textbook affordability materials. Um, but what's great about our data sheets is even if we're not there, they're easily updatable at this point. The, the heavy lift has been done and it was done by our graduate student worker. She did much of this work for us and we are eternally grateful to her for doing it because it's just not something we would have had the time to do. So we can continually update those sheets to make sure that we're approaching that goal if we haven't actually already hit it. We can mark these courses in Banner. We can find those Z degree courses. We can also find courses where they're not using OER, where we know there's good quality OER and we can target them for uh, you know, going to their departments and talking to them and saying, hey, let's talk about OER. So um, we're hoping to have this done by the end of the semester so we know exactly where we're at and then we can formulate our next strategic plan goal. And that's it. Thank you very much. Yes, um, just want to let people remind people that we will get to the questions after everybody's presented. So, let's go back. The, which one? That one. Okay, good. We got it. <laughs> Is it sharing it now then already? Yes. Can you hear my audio through there? If I stay here, <laughs> uh, maybe the online people can comment if they can hear me. Ask them. <laughs> can y'all hear me online? Yes. yes. Okay, good. We're kind of going back and forth, and it's, okay, it's weird it. otherwise. See, we know this going. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Carolyn Morris. I'm the Director of Content Solutions for Cersei Dynix. And I'm presenting today with Terry Galloway, Executive Director of Stealth. And what we wanted to share was the top 10 benefits of course reading list software. Um, so courseless software is software that enables the yeah. Where's the zoom? Oh, zoom is there. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. 
a little rusty. <laughs> Can you see him now? <laughs> it's a little learning curve. Okay. Um, are you seeing the presenter view? Not that it matters. Are you seeing the presenter view online? Yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay. But we got to go in. Yeah, I think it's good enough. Okay. So. We'll head, skip ahead. So courseless software is software that enables library staff and faculty to collaborate on, in building online interactive course reading lists. And then those lists are published to the learning management system. I am gonna to share today clips from the courseless software included in CloudSource away from Circe Dynix because that's what I have access to. But um, Leganto from Ex Libris and Talis from um, Sage would have very similar um, functionality. And this is really about why this kind of software is something libraries should really consider. Um, so with that, we'll get to our top 10. Our number one feature is uh, that the courseless software supports the academic library mission. Academic libraries support both the teaching and the research of faculty and student communities. So the curriculum of the institution is reflected in the collection and the library provides tools and resources to deliver that curriculum. So the software allows people to do a search, faculty members to do a search and find library resources uh, and quickly with just a couple of clicks, add them to their course reading list instead of having to hand type the metadata or provide the librarian with information that may not be quite enough to actually find the resource. So just simple drag and drop into the list once they found what they want. Two, courseless software streamlines library workflows. Um, this ensures availability of course readings and reserved material. Um, and in a pandemic situation, this was often severely interrupted at the start um, and inadequate tools to deliver resources straight to the learning management system was difficult. So courseless software better connects faculty with library resources during course design activities. So the librarians can get reports through this software that show them the faculty selections and let them act upon those, whether they need to digitize something, order something, or expand licensing um, permissions. Okay, number three. This facilitates collaboration with faculty. Faculty need easy ways to communicate with the library about the resources they are selecting are multiple copies needed, for example, or do they need assistance in locating material for a course objective? And faculty can then use a browser extension or a bookmarklet to add content from almost any website. So this includes things like YouTube and Amazon, and all of the metadata goes to the librarian so that they're not left with a bare record or just a title trying to figure out what this is and how to add it. Number four. Courseless software helps libraries ensure timely availability and the right quantity of resources needed for classes. Libraries often need to address preparation of delivery of online and physical course materials. With courseless software, libraries can start as early as faculty select and add those resources, ideally before the semester begins. So the software provides reporting that shows not only the course name, but how many students are enrolled and what's been selected even before the faculty member has necessarily completed their reading list. This gives the library visibility into what's going to be assigned and how many users they're going to have for those resources, 
even before the faculty's finished that list. So they can start to work on it and not be reliant on the faculty actually emailing them a, an attachment that may come a day or two before classes start. Number five, uh, course lists helps faculty organize materials. Faculty build courses around learning objectives and often in modular sequencing. Courseless software allows faculty to work in an iterative mode on locating and adding materials from the collection as they progress through the course design. And here, it's very easy for faculty to add notes, to move things, and to move things around. They can just type in quickly and then drag and drop resources so they get them in the order they want. They can also put them in different sections and release them at different times. So if they don't wanna release the whole reading list at once, they can um, wait and do that as the course progresses. Number six, the software helps meet students where they are in the learning management system. The software connects the discovery and delivery of resources. Faculty can easily push out their reading list without searching for the elusive permalink and without uploading large files to the learning management systems. And then students can access everything in one location. And all of this works on a standard called LTI. So it works with almost any learning management system that's current today and works with all of, all of the vendors would work in the same way. Makes it very smooth and easy for both faculty and the students. Number seven, it helps students find and use what they need. In past days, students scan the syllabus looking for links or headed to Google Scholar to track down a reading. Courseless software delivers the resources, so precious time is hopefully spent reading and engaging and not searching. So the links take students directly to the resource if it's an electronic resource. And if it's not, if, if it's a physical resource, it takes a student to the library record for that. So they are put directly in touch with the library version of this resource. Okay, number eight, my favorite. This supports OER and affordable learning with a simplified process of locating and importing resources like OER textbooks and library owned ebooks. Faculty can reduce the time needed to curate resources for their courses and at no cost to the student. This reduces the need to rely on high cost prepackaged resources. One of the great things about this software is it can let the library suggest a lot of different sources. So the library is not restricted to one and it can really just sort of lead the faculty into choosing high quality things that will be free for the student to use that then supports the affordable learning initiatives of the library and generally the institution as a whole. Number nine, we're driving use of library materials. The software enhances discovery of library materials during course design with built-in searching tools, directing faculty to consider library provided content as they build courses. And the really great thing about this is that because it's a direct link, we actually start to collect the true use of students of the library resources so that it's not just an uploaded PDF where the faculty member downloaded the PDF, one library usage, and then 30 students use it without ever getting uh, logging that usage for the library. So this is a really great way for the library to get an accurate count of how often its resources are being used in uh, classwork. Up with keeping the library at the center of the process. Not only does the software route faculty to the collections during course building, but it allows libraries to better monitor use, aligning collection development priorities with curriculum, and providing rich data usage of collections to tell the story of how the library supports the teaching mission. And that's what we have for today. Thank you for joining us. I would like the speakers to get close up here so if there's any questions, you can be able to hear it through the monitor. And so I'm going to look online. Is there any questions from the, the group? 
I know there was a question about I go back. So anybody in the audience here? So when you find the undiscovered use of OER, do you have them on the back? Do you have them an award? So the question here was, uh, do you give out awards to faculty uh, using OER? Using OER? Uh, yeah, we have, um, uh, we're instituting a faculty champion program uh, for people who use OER. And like I said in the presentation, we don't want to limit it just to the folks who go through our stipend program. So as we identify people, they get put in the mix. Um, we're also uh, going to be working with SGA so that students can nominate. So if there's somebody who's using OER that we don't even find through our curriculum mapping project, um, they can nominate that instructor. We can go to that instructor and find out what they're using and include them as well. Questions on the chat? Somebody asked how, I don't remember, somebody was asking how large is North Alabama? Uh, we have an enrollment of 8,800 8, yeah. at North Alabama. We're a medium sized institution. We're a regional university. All right, here is a question for Jennifer. When reaching out with faculty, you found at the bookstore analysis, I assume, oh goodness, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long one. Okay. Um, you found, you should listen. We actually don't get our book list from the bookstore. I think that's what you're asking. Um, the bookstore has not been very cooperative. When we did get a book list from them, it's in a format that we really couldn't use. Right. <laughs> always. <laughs> and, always. And they sent it to us with a note that said, this is proprietary information, don't use it, which is ridiculous because I can go on the bookstore's webpage and look up every single course at every single book for every single course. So it's not proprietary information. Instead, we go to the administrative assistants for every department on campus. And we ask them that when they submit their list to the bookstore for orders that they also send a list to us. Um, I think all these were really good talks about things that you can help uh, the library uh, to, to further with students. I think a lot of the, you're trying to do some diversity and inclusion in your, um, and that, there's a lot of talks about that here at the conference. Yeah, and so is there any other questions? Do the librarians need to have access to the LMS when they're using the software for reserve lists? They have to have accounts for so, There needs to be um, just an initial setup that ties the two together, but no, then the librarians don't need access to the LMS. So it's usually just a, a very quick thing for the LMS administrator to add or get the secret key that that's added to the um, course list software. There's certainly more than what you showed on the slide. There's Biblio, you, and other. Yeah, and those are, the, those are the big ones I knew about, yeah. Well, I think we need to wrap up uh, for, the, for this morning's session. Thank you for attending online and in person. There's a few people here. And uh, everybody have a good rest of your morning. Thank you.